Eco-socialism is practice. It's not a theory. It is not something that we can debate intellectually, right? For eco, to understand what eco-socialism is, you have to take off your shoes. You have to put your hands on the land. You have to know what these plants are. You gotta know what a clover is. You gotta know what a dandelion is, right? That you could eat it, right? You have to understand what the land gives you to understand what you need to give back in order for this relationship to, to become something that can serve us and, and, and benefit us all. So I'm from Chico, California, occupied Machupta territory in the Maidu bio region, in the Sacramento River watershed. All of these things are important. I live in fire country, fire's home, right? I came to Chico three months before the campfire, which is the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California's history, wiped out the town of Paradise, a city of 26,000 people, left 52,000 people displaced. All of these things we want to talk about, climate refugees, deaths, all of that stuff, we have been living in that reality for four years, right? And it's because of that, unfortunately, but maybe fortunately, right? It's because of that like apocalyptic disaster that affected our whole, our whole region that we're actually able to have and see and exploit openings to introduce principles, methods, and practices of eco-socialism that we dare not call eco-socialism. <laughs> All right, this is uh, Trump, country red state with a with, you know with 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 all kinds of right wingers in power so we don't want, need to call it eco-socialism we call it do you want to burn to death or not <laughs> all right <laughs> that's one way that we have been able to use the practice of eco-socialism to get a wide variety of people on board you know and these are rural people too no matter what their political orientation Rural people have at least some kind of cogni cognitive understanding of a connection to land. I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, all the truck people or whatever, but there are people who fish, there are people who farm, there are people who, you know, again, don't want to burn to death, right? And it's that understanding that, you know, there are no more ideas, so they're open to new ones that has allowed, you know, some of these practices to actually go forward. Um, so, um, I, my organization is, um, organization called TEK Chico. TEK means traditional ecological knowledge. It is the science and practice of indigenous ecological relationship to the native ecosystem, right? That is still held by indigenous people. Remember, California is only 180 years old, right? You know, they like to say the natives were prehistoric. The natives that were, that were doing stuff in 1840 <laughs> are prehistoric. Uh-uh, right? If we think about people who are, have the genetically same capabilities of cognitive development, of, of social development, of civilizational development, all on the same page before white contact, right? Um, and, um, and so, and so, you know, it's four or five generations at the most removed from the knowledge of this. And everybody likes to mobilize that myth of Ishi, that being the last wild Indian in California. It's not true, you know? The truth is, is that again, five generations, it's only two grandmothers ago, right? And that knowledge continues to exist in the traditional practitioners and the people who um, continue to and have continued their uh, ecological practices of, um, of, of tending the landscape, um, you know, underground, outlawed for many, many years, but is now experiencing a revival precisely because the consequences of not tending the land, of replumbing the ecosystem, of, you know, replacing the oak woodlands with timber plantations is now coming back on everybody. Right? 
Does that, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, we were talking about, because uh, in CERN's presentation, there was a pyronimbula, you know, that, that whole, that scary, scary image of the pyrocumulus cloud, right? Of a firestorm creating its own weather. You know, it's very, very, very scary. It looks apocalyptic. But what did you say about it, Jonathan? So, and I, I want to, before I say something, I want to yeah. contextualize. I was thinking about something from our, from our native community. I think before I would feel pretty, in some ways, insufficient because we wouldn't have the fancy terminology. We wouldn't be able to quote so-and-so's theory. And then it, for some reason today, it kind of dawned on me. It was, it's observation, it's our stories. Mm -hmm. And so part of our stories, if you want to call it theory or philosophy, is based in observation of what's actually happening. And then maybe codifying that in stories and looking at things as metaphors. And so even with this pyrocumulus cloud, so to understand this a little bit further, in case you're not a fire weather behavior, you know, expert, what, what this does is that when, when, when fires burn, there's these different factors, topography, your fuels, and then your weather. And, and those things combined will di dictate, like you can actually do computer models now to like dictate how high the flames are gonna be. But, and, and, and now what was happening though is like these, these fires are generating their own fire, weather. So you have a whole nother element, right? So it's this new, it's this new cycle where that hot air goes up, creates cloud, and that when, when that air cools, it, it comes down super fast and spreads. So this fire that just started yesterday is burning approximately on an average a thousand acres an hour right now. It was, it started yesterday at two or three hours ago. It was 1,800, 18,000 acres. And what we're talking about is how do we take that this metaphor of the, of the pyrocumulus and turn it into a positive thing? We're, we're headed toward catastrophic situations. How do we take that ignition source and do something positive with it? Right. And so part of re reconnecting that relationship, part of this, you know, putting these eco-socialist principles into practice is understanding exactly what land you are on. When we understand that we're in fire's home, we're in California. California is a young landscape geologically. Sierra Nevadas are only 40 million years old. There's volcanoes, there's droughts, there's floods. Everything is extreme in California. You know, there's a 200 year flood that nobody knows about because California's only 180 years old. <laughs> but it's gonna wipe out the whole Central Valley, all those dams, the third largest agricultural economy in the world. And that's only something that we know from stories and the knowledge of indigenous peoples who have lived those disaster cycles for a long time. So that's one of the things that we don't know what we don't know unless we deeply, deeply engage in the land that we are on. And that, yes, means you have to talk to the indigenous people of your place. That is an imperative. I'll, I'll do more about it in the decolonization section, but that is one imperative that I think, you know, I think the, the eco-socialist international has understood, you know, um, and so, but we're people, we're just people, right? I'm not rich. I was homeless when I got to, to Chico. I came to Chico because there was nowhere else to go. And my friend was all like, here, you can stay at my place. It was totally random, right? Well, maybe not random because it put me in touch with indigenous practitioners. So Ali Metters Knight, who is my comrade and who is the matriarch of our whole program and the, the holder of the knowledge, um, you know, and spearheading all of this stuff. You know, uh, she is a tribal member of the Mechupta tribe. She does not have land, you know. Um, one of the unique things about California, even though it's 12% of the federally recognized tribes in California, is it was the most diverse and densely populated area on, on Turtle Island before contact. Um, most indigenous people in California do not have land. There was only one reservation that exists in Hoopa. You know, most people were, were genocided, removed, and, and brought to rancherias. So, you know, we had the, the, the Concow uh, Maidu had their own trail of tears that was brought to Round Valley in Mendocino. So what do we do? We need to connect with the land. We need to put our hands on the land. How do people without land put their hands on the land? Well, how Ali started was with public land. It was a public park, right? 
uh, Verbena Fields in Chico. It was a rock quarry, okay? It was like, it had been dug up, dredged, um, you know, the, and the gravel ground up to build Highway 99, right? So it was a gravel pit. It was literally shit. It was a shit pile. It was also where um, the people who built the suburban homes around it dumped their construction waste. So it was literally a shit pile, right? And so the city were, was like, okay, we have to clean this up because like people are going over there and doing drugs and doing all kinds of weird stuff. So they decided to make it a park. And so um, they spent $4 million to, um, uh, not only that, it was a, in a floodplain. It was in a, in a creek channel. So the houses, the nice houses that they built were in danger of getting flooded <laughs> because like, they didn't take care of this area. So they spent $4 million to clean out all of the shit and to um, dig swales so that it could be a flood channel, uh, a flood, uh, flood control for the neighborhood. But then they didn't have any more, they had no more money for maintenance. So what, and, and because, okay, because there's a state law, SB 18, that requires tribal consultation um, any time that an open space designation is done in a general plan, you know, that, yes, legal protection civil right allowed Allie to step in as a tribal practitioner and said, I'll take care of the place. I'll take care of the place for free. You know, she just wanted land to try. With pe if, you have pe if you are without land or without access to land and you need land, public land, right? There's a lot of public land that needs to be managed. Public land is 30% of the continental landmass of Turtle Island, right? That is technically our collectively held land. How kind of socialist is that? A little bit of collective property, right? So, so that's what she did. She stepped in and said, I will manage this place, right? And she's a traditional basket weaver, right? And if people don't understand what it takes to make a basket, even those ones that you buy in Pier 1 or whatever, you know, there's no machine that makes a basket, you know, even if, yes, they're, you know, 10 year old people, 10 year olds in Indonesia making baskets that's still made out of natural materials, that it still requires quality material, which means you need a quality ecosystem to provide quality basket material. And so the social, ecological, political, right, and ownership relations around water, particularly for willow and riparian uh, uh, corridors, you need to have those relationships of the social and ecological re reproduction in order to make something as simple as a basket. It's not actually simple. It is an advanced technology that comes out, that, that requires the management of an ecosystem to actually have, right? And so, you know, she was taking care of it by herself for 12 years. She moved up to Klamath, did a bunch of stuff, you know, and. And so it kind of fell off. But when she came back during the campfire, she was like, okay, we are going to take care of this place together. And so she, you know, I, I was there and I was all like, all right, we, we're on this, right? Like we started to move and we started to make the call. Every Friday from 10 to 1 p.m., everybody can come to Verbena Fields and learn how to tend this piece of land. And over the last three years, uh, we have... Uh, uh, cultivated a community institution that is based on a deep relationship with a particular piece of land and i can't tell you how transformative i think that has been for our community it's been not just transformative for the community in terms of you know having that deep engagement understanding what plants are what plants can do for you what plants do for each other right the pollinators help cut came and helped the land the birds came and helped the land we got a otter we got a beaver you know like like understanding because we are actually engaged in and tra physically transforming a piece of land how that has transformed us and three years after regular weekly management by 10 to 15 maybe sometimes 25 people that the land itself has responded you know, now Verbena Fields is famous as the best park in Chico. It is, the, it is a park where, you know, uh, they're like, well, it's the one place that homeless people don't go to. But actually we do have one guy, but he helps take care of it too. 
anybody who wants to come, we tell them, this is how you take care of it, you know? And, um, and that, now we have over a hundred species of native plants and functional native ecosystem in the 17 acres. Um, we have fixed the riparian corridor with beaver biomimicry so that when the, when the, when the big flood, winter floods did come, it actually, the flood uh, a channel worked the way it was supposed to and did not flood the houses. We've improved, you know, all kinds of stuff there and it, and it has served as a proof of concept that active management of ecosystems improves and regenerates ecosystems. And that has gotten us to the next level, which is looking at federal land, contracts with the Forest Service, contracts with, um, you know, because you know what? It, you know, it, volunteerism is real nice, but then you only have a certain amount of people who, can, who, who are able to do that, right? There's a privileged people that can do that you know, at the, our, the, the tribal community and the, the, the community of underprivileged people won't have access to that unless we give them jobs. And so we, we, we took, um, you know, some of the, the tribal families around and produced a crew. So now we have a crew that goes out and does contracts, forest contracts. You know, we need to get paid for this. If we are going to take care of public land, we need to get paid. And so in order to do that, we had to go testify to Congress. We had to go in every public comment. We had to go, you know, uh, uh, go into meetings with elected officials at, you know, uh, the, the National Congress of American Indians put in the 2018 Farm Bill, 63 tribal provisions that gave indigenous peoples un, uh, unprecedented access to public land under a Trump administration, mind you. How did they do that? They put a bunch of stuff in there. They're like, they, they probably didn't even read it. They just passed it. <laughs> it like, they just snuck it in. <laughs> but you know what? That has a name. So that, so that means engaging with the state, right? If we're going, if, if landless people are going to get their, our hands on land, we need to figure out the policy pathway to be able to do that. And we need to come up with, with proposals, concrete proposals for projects that can be funded, yes, with public money. Yeah. You know? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, 90% of our crew are formerly incarcerated native and black people, right? Um, and then they need to get paid. They, we have families to feed. You know, we have families to take care of, right? And so, and so putting those jobs programs together is something that requires an engagement with the state. I like to say that my job is I translate TEK to bureaucrat so that we can get money. That's what it is, you know? But each one of those, it, it, to each one of those contracts, we have the right to gather seeds in perpetuity. We have the right to access the land in perpetuity, right? And we have the, the right to to do monitoring and to be able to get more stuff, right? And we're finding all kinds of ways, but the, the focus is always get the hands on the land, right? And so, and so that can take so many different forms. But I think what eco-socialism means is that, you know, we have to find those collective ways because in order for people like us to get our hands on the land, we have to open up that pathway for everybody. Right. And that means policy engagement. That means politics. Right. So, um, you know, basically to sum up is that, you know, one of the things I'd like to see out of this group and one of the things that we can try to do is to find projects that we can do together. Concrete projects. So there's a lot of money coming down for land management because of all of the disasters that are happening, you know, and that's something that we can figure out together. Because you know what, if, that's, if that money for the National Seed Program doesn't go to people like us, it's going to go to people like Monsanto, right? And I don't mean groveling about it, I mean fin dommy, okay? We're going to fin dom government agents, we're going to fin dom the, the, the nonprofit industrial complex to get us the money to do what needs to be done, because it needs to be done. You know, one, one last thing I want to throw out there, because a lot of people do live in uh, do have unions and stuff. <laughs> TIAA-CREF is the largest 
uh, owner of farmland in the United States. TIA CREF is uh, it, it does that with the money of the pension money of uh, uh, teachers, of public employees, everywhere. If unions can realize that you actually own land, you own farmland with your money, and if you can get together to find ways to say we want the right to manage and have the seeds and be able to have a relationship with the land that you bought for us with our money, that might be something that could be transformational. Right? And, um, and then that's it. You know, we also need urban and rural linkages because 80% of, uh, of our cities are in places that are going to be destroyed by climate change. So we do need to think about, uh, you know, escape, you know, escape agriculture. We have to think about ways that we can, you know, uh, uh, escape from the cities if we need to. And that's, and that's one way, also a way that we can all link together in different ways. Vermont's close to New York, you know? Like, it, those are things that we can do. And it's things that we have to do collectively together. And for me, that's, that puts these principles of eco-socialism into practice that we can fight for today. And so, that's it. Yeah. <laughs>